Hello, good afternoon, evening, anytime in anywhere in the world you are. Yep, we have sound, everything is working hunky dory. Um, welcome everyone. Um, we are continuing uh, Ladies of D&D celebration of in December. And today we have an exciting uh, panel featuring some indie game creators here. And um, we're going to have a good time. Any cool, relaxing music you hear is uh, thanks to uh, North Foundry. Our person behind the scenes is uh, Jenna, and thank you to her and the community for inviting us, for giving us a space to discuss what I think is going to be some very insightful conversation and hopefully helpful to anyone who um, is looking to further their relationship within the industry or uh, wanting to maybe take a few steps in. Uh, I'm Aida. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Uh, I'm American. I live in Europe. My family's from South America. I am fairly new to TTRPG. I play mostly Dungeons and Dragons 5e. But it's thanks to really opening and sharing communities like this that I get to experience uh, different kinds of games and see how developed uh, really the community is. And this panel gives me an opportunity to see the people who put a lot of their time and effort behind that. So uh, thank you in advance to everyone joining us here. So let's just take really fast uh, introductions. And after introductions, uh, I'd like to do a very small um, uh, uh, kind of a break the ice game with everyone. So I'm just going to uh, go in the order that the Twitch is laid out. And first we have Kome. Hey, so nice for, for you to, to having me. Um, so sh sh should I introduce myself or? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I'm, um, my, my pronouns are uh, he and him. I'm a French uh, TTRPG creator. Well, I've Kind of a, of a junior creator. I've, I've, I've started uh, making games four years ago. Um, I think, yeah, that's about all I should say. Maybe for the for the introduction, <laughs> let's leave some mystery. Ooh. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have the wonderful curl definition rocking Amelia. Hello. Coming at you from Scenic Rome, I am the lead developer of Witch and Craft Games, and we do we do things. Our big thing is twelve, and you should you should know that game because we are playing it on in December, every Saturday. If you if you don't come to that to that game, I'm gonna curse you into becoming a frog, but not not a, not a cool queer frog, a really ugly gross frog. They're beautiful too. That's just how it is. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we have Mansfeld. Yes. Uh, hi. Hi. In December, my pronouns are he and and him, and I am the TTRPG TTRPG uh, blogger and creator. I, I could say junior creator because I tend to I started to create the TTRPG games like well, I released my first game in the October this year, so it's very recent actually. Um, yeah, and that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for anyone in the audience, uh, we'll be taking questions. Uh, if it's really pertinent and juicy to what we're discussing, we're going to slide it in. Otherwise, uh, we're going to have it um, towards the end or after we finish a topic. We'll be taking breaks every now and then to stretch our legs, uh, drink some liquids and have some fun. But first, as promised, a bit of an icebreaker. And I have here a very cool game called Seal of Approval, which might sound familiar to one person. <laughs> this is a little game developed by Mansfeld, actually. And um, I'm going to play this a little bit differently. So the premise of the game is everyone here, myself included, we're all seals. You know, the outrick animal, they live underwater, they go like this. Aww. Yes. Normally the game is played via a checklist, but since we are kind of here, uh, I'm going to provide a list. And your job is to give your seal of approval or not. If you agree with an item or you give it your seal of approval, please clap like a seal. This is your seal of approval. If you do not give an item on the list your seal of approval, please raise your seal flippers and go no. <laughs> so let's begin. Dig dignified, extremely. <laughs> <laughs> Do you give your seal of approval to hunting fish? I mean, if you're a seal, 
If I am CR, yeah. I, I have to, like contractually. <laughs> right? You can be That's any kind of seal you want. So <laughs> the only one that both... doesn't, I think, ants I think it ants penguins, so that's even like more objectionable. <laughs> now, according to the game, if there are seals who approve and disapprove, it is an opportunity to come together and discuss whether we can maybe bring it to an approval or we agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. I mean, Amelia brought up a point that sure. seals have to eat fish, but yeah. I think uh, Mansfeld and Com have different opinions. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It depends if I'm come the human or, or come the, the seal. Yeah, I guess as a human, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm kind of on the fence about it. As a seal, I, I kind of agree with Amelia. I think I have no choice if I want to survive in the long long run. <laughs> I, I raise you a point, though. If you're a human, the only way to eat swordfish is through hunting. And I don't know if I'm ready to live in a world in which you don't eat swordfish. <laughs> okay, we, we agree to disagree. So we yeah. will go through the full list. So on that topic, please let me know if you give your seal of approval or not. Being vegan. Uh, hey. Yeah, sure. Okay, you have I to put a lot of work in it. I'm the only like, one you have to put out. A lot of work in it. And you know what? If as a seal or as a human, I am educated and smart enough to find alternative methods to uh, get my food on, then I will approve. So we have consensus. I think it's okay. like, it's a matter of like, it's really hard to achieve. You need to be in a very privileged position to be able um, to be vegan. I'd love that. to be a privileged oh, seal. That's true. And I am not <laughs> a privileged seal, so... Okay, next, next item. As a seal, do you give your seal of approval as seals to chasing penguins for fun? Oh, sure. <laughs> seal of approval, unanimous. Um, uh, that's a no-brainer. And the last item, as seals, do you give your approval on approving things? <laughs> <laughs> no, heck it. Always say no. Do we agree to disagree, or do we want to try to bring Amelia on to I am fine with I am fine with spreading the, the, the resolution or whatever the whatever the name for uh, for the, the, the rising of the of the revolutionary seals is gonna be. I think it's just for me that clapping is much uh, more fun than just shaking your hands. <laughs> Look. Flippers. Look. Flippers, right. <laughs> Maybe we can agree that if a seal of approval must exist, then ergo, perhaps a seal of disapproval may also exist too. It's an interesting question, actually. <laughs> so, that was um, a very short game developed by Mansell. Thank you for, uh, I didn't ask, that's but uh, cool. thank you for creating it because that's a, a, a nice, silly way to just like kind of break the ice, as seals will also like the ice as well. So, um, now for a bit of the, the meat and bones up here while the seal uprising is happening. So, um, we're here because you are all creators. Whether you label yourself as junior or professional, intermediate, god of all creators. Um, <laughs> don't flaunt it. Um, for me as a layperson, especially perhaps as I was a child, playing, I'm aging myself here, but uh, playing NES Super Mario. I think uh, there's a difference between me playing on the controller saying, oh, this is insert opinion. But perhaps a lot of you, uh, developers and people in the audience here especially, were playing this game or any other game and thinking, if I was the one making this game, it needs to have this. So my question to you is, uh from an early point before you started developing games as you were playing games what sort of elements did you feel if you could make these games now you are what are these games i love missing what would i add to these games and i wanted to also ask yourself are they mechanical or are they storytelling 
So let's go backwards from the introduction. So uh, Mansfeld, if you could start us off. Ah, I love the question about the question was about what what to add missing to the game or overall. Yeah. About what what the, what do you when when you were growing up, perhaps what did you miss in games that made you think I need to make games that have this thing that I missed? I could I say want. that uh, when I started to play the uh, tabletop role playing games. The games that I played were were missing about actually the component of making story. I mean, I mean making. I mean having the procedures, rules, rulings, or at least well techniques actually to to actually engage in into making something that is wasn't created before the game. So those games that I played like D and D, Warhammer Fantasy role playing, Savage Worlds, or such. They are they are their premise premise was was about. The premise was about actually playing pre-made story, someone else story, actually. And th those games doesn't have a, a conscious, uh, te conscious techniques to actually make it during the game. Only some ephemeras like task resolution or like making combats or actually, or doing, or GM doing his own stuff, actually. Uh, his, uh, their stuff, actually. Their stuff. So, so no, no, no framework, no structure, no, actually, yes, no engine, actually. So that's what you thought about the games you started. So that was kind of what incited you. Is it fair to say that that is kind of what led you to want to start to make your own games that missed those gaps? Yes. However, I could I could say strong but because when I tried to actually, first of all, I wanted to learn about different games, and I stumbled upon some uh, games inspired by either either by the. Uh, the Forge movement or or other games like like PBTA or later and I thought that okay there are, there are a lot of awesome games that somebody created already created so why I bother to actually create that because somebody already created that and it's it looks good so why I, should I create that it's because something is already at hand and then actually the primary motivation to actually making the game the first my very service game october last was to well there is an old concept called ishenna gavenda in it's it's full story in english or autumn story in english it, it, it that wasn't a game it wasn't actually the, the ttrpg movement about warping War, warhammer fantasy role-playing game into uh into something more dark more muddy more actually well, I could say about losing, about uh, taking away players' agency, actually, I would say. And I feel that what if I could make a game that does it, does it what Ishina Gavenda tried to, to do, but without actually being GM the dickhead, actually, asshole. Because Ishina Gavenda relied on being the GM and asshole, <laughs> actually, in short. <laughs> Sorry, let me let me see if I got this right. Someone looked at VFR uh, um, Warhammer Fantasy Battle, the role playing game. Someone looked at it. I, I'm assuming second edition, and thought, you know what this game needs? More ways for you to die miserably. It was the first edition in Poland, in just before Perfect. the okay. Play Dirty has been released, actually. I mean, okay. So I I still I still maintain my point. Someone looked at Warhammer and thought this is not bleak enough. I, yes. I think it's interesting Mansfield's points about uh, uh, the what he found the lack of storytelling and what he found the uh, uh, opportunities. There were too many opportunities for someone to be overhead and kind of to be lauding over the players, which is kind of how I interpreted your answer. I find it really interesting how that evolved into. The game we just played, which is about mm. very chill, it's about, it, it encourages consensus making, but in a non-serious thing. So it's really uh, interesting to to literally see that development from A to B. So thank you very much for your answer and also for making that game. Uh, let's swing to uh, Amelia. Uh, so the original question was, uh, mm -hmm. when you were playing the games, what did you personally find <coughs> missing that you needed to include in the games you played or you had to make your own games to fix this wrong that you found? Like, let me put it like this. I like to paint myself as a genius. And maybe I am. I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna... But it doesn't mean that there isn't like a lot of very smart game devs out there making games. There is in fact many. 
And believe me or not, most of the things that you can think about have been done. I guess really what I what I want when I make games is not just like it's not like oh this needs to be better. I'm going to I'm going to improve upon it. It's more like what is my perspective on this? Like, how can how does my experience as a person relate to TTRPGs, and what does that create in in a in a developing environment? Most of the games we make at, at Witch and Craft are very personal. Like, they are extremely personal games that only exist because they are made by the person that made them. I guess, like, I guess, kind of that is that is a thing though. Like, putting your personal experience in the game creates a game that is that feels way more real than than just you know well that's a game about uh, defeating the dragon and getting the treasure i suppose yeah it's just like you can see, you can see it when people pick it up you can you can like you can you can feel it that something is passing from you to them and i think that's like important and you know if I have to just point out one thing that, like, just mechanically, that I think it's very important, like developing games, that that and, and kind of moves from what Manfred was saying. Solving the GM tyranny is something that we have been trying to do for thirty years, and well, that, that's an answer. My answer was to make was to uh, give the GM a very a very specific role inside the game world and then create a numerical uh, a numerical value representing how far the, the, the story had gone so it takes away from the GM the decision of essentially who wins now what happens now that's a number once you get to that number either the, the part that got to it wins that's about it the decision is is being given to a third part that is completely unbiased and fair. Oh, that's really interesting. I especially like the point where you said that uh, it, if if I can reword, you didn't really relate to the stories of going out and killing the dragon. I mean, um, twelve yes. uh, occult eye and uh, inner demon seems to be. Mm -hmm very much about personal traumas and not you, knowing you as a person i can me, assume that let me put it like flavored this. let me put it like this going out and killing the dragon can be a personal experience it's never it's rarely presented in a personal way mm -hmm. i think i think something that is coming out a lot in the new age of ttrpgs and something i am grateful to be here for is linking your personal experiences and making them a metaphor of the game you're playing because that just makes the story so much more real as as a completely unbiased player in one of amelia's mm -hmm. game uh, there's some realness <laughs> to there so uh, thank you for your answer uh thank you for creating the game that i am uh, currently enjoying <laughs> and that everyone else can catch it in december more details later uh come uh, last but not least, um, the original question was, um, when you were playing games, what elements did you find you needed to include as you were creating them? Uh, well, yeah, I, th that's a good rephrasing of, of your question, because um, I, I never, I, I don't think I ever, you know, played a game and thought, okay, this is bad, I can do better, or, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, this is not the way to do it, and if I were to do it, I would do it in another way. I think it was more for me like, oh, this is such a cool idea, and I need to steal it for my next game. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that, that's really how I started. I mean, my, my first game my first games uh, were uh, one pagers where I just stole everything uh, from, you know, I loved from other creators. So they were not good games by definition because they didn't really add uh, anything uh, specific or original to the mix. But that was, I think, a necessary step for me to uh, get to the good part, uh, so to speak. Um, but then, yeah, I, I think for, for my current uh, way of creating, um, 
uh, let me let me just before I answer, I want to to uh, uh, bounce on what uh, Amelia was saying about. I, I love what she said about the GM tyranny because uh -huh. uh, most of my uh, the games I I create are still uh, games with GMs, but it it's it just so happens that I'm a very very lazy GM, <laughs> and so uh, what I do and and what my games look like usually is that there's a GM, but it's just there to. Uh, you know, like uh, launch the first scene and then just sit back, relax and enjoy the, the looking and listening to the players um, uh, interacting with each other. And um, that, that's really something I, I like to do and I like to, to uh, implement in my, in my own games. But yeah, other than that, I think it's just, it's mostly about um, uh, character interaction for me. Uh, I love drama. So, you know, the, the more drama there is, the more uh history there is the more uh, interesting in, uh, interactions there are between the characters the, the better it is and um so that's i think one of the thing i i try to always have uh the other thing and it's also uh, related to my laziness is uh the complexity of the mechanics i feel that uh, many rpgs are you know too complex for their own sake and that you can usually simplify a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, dice rolling and, and, and things like that, and still uh, keep it interesting. So uh, with time, I find that I'm more and more into not entirely. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it's it's always narrative driven. It's it's not. Uh, I, I forgot the term, but it's not entirely without rules. It's mm -hmm. more rules light than anything. Uh, but yeah, if 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 the rules, you know, if the summary of the rules is longer than one page, uh, that's not for me, basically, because <laughs> I have a very small brain. It's ah, actually I quite time with apologist. <laughs> it's kind of interesting because you actually use the label GM tyranny. <laughs> it's actually it's quite inter interesting because I, I thought up less about the GM itself, how it impacts the game, more about how the game is pre-planned pre or, pre or the story is actually prepared before the play itself. And the, in, in while during the session, we don't actually create the story in traditional RPGs, more like we actually experience what is pre uh, actually pre pre prepared. <coughs> so, so I wanted to point at that issue. <laughs> of actually uh, uh, making story without without a gm input did uh, you do you know about not the gm know? actually without anyone oh, okay. inputs before the session actually. Oh, okay oh, no. do you know arium the game you should okay. look it up uh, arium by adaptive Igorus. you should look it up because it's uh, uh it's basically a setting creator uh a setting creator manual it's it's very cool Okay. And basically, like it's one one book. It's about creating the setting, and the other is about creating the system that you're going to play in the setting. Nice. It's actually super super smart. Uh, yeah, no, the people that the people that made it, that make it are like so good at it. Toss, toss it in the chat for someone else to uh, start googling as soon as, oh, yeah. as fast as they can. Yeah. Um, uh, so well, can I? Calm. Is it? Am I wrong in thinking that we have something in common? Are you? Were you? Did you also used to work in comics? Uh, no. Because you talk like a comic something. I, <laughs> I wish. Uh, the last comics I drew were when I was fifteen. So no. <laughs> you talk like a comic artist, basically like me. <laughs> it like you know, stealing is great. Agreed. Large agreed. <laughs> and also like. In gen, like uh, simplifying is also like a big value, well, and I also agree. It's I think very that, like comic yeah. artist points. That's because okay, so actually in real life, I'm a, I'm an English teacher, so mm. I think you know that that bleeds a lot into what I'm doing because simplifying things so that students can understand and and uh, you know going straight to the point, uh, helping them to to uh, remember uh, the. The, the most uh, important part and forgetting the rest. Yeah, I think I think I, I do that both as a teacher and as a, an RPG uh, player and, and creator. I think that's an interesting segue because that's actually something I wanted to discuss about. And it's something that both Amelia and Corme uh, talked about where Amelia essentially said she wanted to uh, avoid reinventing the wheel. And Corme was like, 
but at the same time, I'm excited about all these ideas and they're worth uh, hashing out and enjoying again. So uh, we'll start the question to uh, Mansfeld is, uh, how do you feel about uh, creating brand new content versus reflavoring or improving whatever you want to uh, put on it? And is that your basis for starting a game? Yes or no? I could say that uh, short answer, I don't know. And long answer is that uh, actually, I don't think in that ca in those categories, actually. Okay, tell me. I think, you think more about, I want to make something that work like something that should make some things, should work like some, should have a desirable outcome, I would say. So whatever I would use to that, is it fit? Is it fit? If I actually accidentally reinvent the wheel, that will happen actually. If not, it wasn't in uh, intended by default actually. For instance, in October Rust, I didn't actually try to invent uh, new things. I mean, new tools, new mechanics or so. I just tried to utilize uh, some some tools like from uh, clocks from Forge in the Dark or like, well, some concept of having success with consequences from the Nobilis or Glitch games from from Jenna Catherine Moran. For instance, so there are also tools that I decided to use or concept that wanted to uh, incorporate in the game rather than trying to make something literally different for the sake of being different. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your answer. So let's uh, go uh, counterclockwise back. Uh, am I doing that right? Yes, uh, Amelia. Mm. We don't hear. Yeah, Amelia, I think. Oh, yeah, sorry. There uh, you go. Reinvent okay. Reinventing the wheel is fine, though. Like, there is nothing wrong about doing something that's already been done as long as there is, like, a spin to it, you know? Uh, a lot of the mechanics I use have been lifted from games that I play, and I just think, yes, this mechanic looks really good and works perfectly, and it would work perfectly in what I'm doing. I guess, like, when I start, when you start making a game, uh, the mechanics tend to come by themselves. You have to, you have to, you have to put, to, to, you have to put before yourself, like, the level of complexity you think the game needs to have and like um everything kind of flows together once you've decided that like the the, the first thing you should know is essentially like what's what's my granularity like well how big of a die i need and the second is like what is the 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 smallest thing that needs to be mechanized once you got that, it's it's all downhill from there. Honestly, mechanics are mechanics are a giant fruit basket. There is so many of them, and you get to just cherry pick all of the cool ones and you slap them together. And if something new comes from that, score. Otherwise, it's probably still still playable. You know. Everyone likes smoothies. Like, <laughs> I am. I am not sure what is new in most of the games that come out today and are still good games so what's what what matter right yeah uh, go ahead come well i i, I mean I, I agree with them uh, with amelia i mean the, the biggest uh trends if i can say it like yes. this like the the uh you know uh pbta and and belonging outside belonging and things like this uh which uh then spawn a whole lot of of uh, other games they do that because the their mechanics is, is very good uh, and it works and so if it works uh, we shouldn't try to I mean it's good if you if you manage to invent such a, a cool new mechanic yourself and then everyone uh, steals it for their own game that, that would be I think that would be the biggest uh, honor for me if I created something and everyone was like wow that's so cool uh, I'm using it for my own game and I'm not cr creating you or anything uh, I think I'd be, I'd be fine with that um, because uh, yeah, I mean, if if the wheel is looks great and and, and you know it works, uh, I'm not going to say no. I'm doing a square wheel because I want to be innovative. Um, yeah, let's let's use what works. And I think the other thing is um, 
the, the, the part where we can be innovative is in the mix and match of things. Um, we can, and that's something I, I do quite often to take, okay, there's this part I like from this game and this part from this game. And, uh, you know, uh, somehow that's the perfect mix I need for my game about uh, such and such uh, subject. Um, you know, after a while, you, you read so many RPGs that you've got these little uh, notes in your head. Uh, and, and, and so they come together almost without you thinking about it. Like, like Amelia was saying, you're, you're just saying, OK, I need a mechanic to do this in my game. And once you have this core element, then you you everything will will organize around it. Okay. There is also like there is also a consideration to make. I think I make games for a living. My my day job is making games. I don't really have the luxury to be like uh, an obvious painter who is amazing at his job, but only paints when they want to and spends like years pursuing the perfect stroke i need to get out something that works in time for my <coughs> next for my next check uh -huh. you know and when when you when you live in a, in such a a situation what 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 you need is to make a game that works in in a deadline and it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like it's completely stolen taking inspiration is fine Lifting mechanics is fine. It's it's a job after all. And you know, I, I made I made twelve. We made the last masquerade. We made uh we're making like Bumper Cat Boy Make a Fan, the other like small game that comes with it. We're making another twelve. I am working on in my own time on Witch Mac. That's like I am going to be fine if only one of these games is a winner, you know? Like in if in if in six years I make six games and only one of them is sick, that's still that's still a win to me. I think if you're only one raising of them really interesting creates, points creates about new stuff. You know that's still fine. I think you're raising really interesting points about sustainability and potential retention, and that is absolutely on my list of questions. And I'm going yeah. to come back to that point. But um, we had a question in the chat that was related because we were talking about mechanics for a while. So um, the question was, if you had a particular mechanic from any other TTRPG, but because you're indie creators, you guys are the other TTRPG. Mm -hmm. So um, is there any a particular mechanic you're really fond of or one in your games that maybe you want to take an opportunity to highlight now? So let's go backwards from where we were the last time. So I think we start with Koma. Uh, can I ask you something first? Yes. Because because I, I think I saw that question and it's specified from a game that is structurally unsound. <laughs> so it has to be something from a it has to be a mechanic you like from a game you don't like. Well, I had the question: What is the coolest mechanic you ever encountered? Oh, okay, it might be a different question then. Because I saw that I question. See questions, I see. You know, you know what? Okay. Yeah, cool yeah. can be cool as in. Um, no, it's a bit of a dark example. Noteworthy. Let's let's change it yeah, there. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Kame, we can start with you. It can be someone else's or your own, because I think we think you're here. So, what you mean? <laughs> well, I think I'm going to to um, cite something from another French uh, creator named uh, Vivien Feasson. He's got a, a, a game in English uh, called Libreté. So the, the title is in is in French, but the, the game is is in English. Um, and it's it's uh, very simple, but it's an idea that uh, you know I, I never really considered before, and it ties back to what we were saying about uh, GM tyranny before. Uh -huh. um, this is a game that uses the um, uh, PBTA system, uh, except there's no stats, and when you roll something, uh, you just add. Um, uh, a kind of token-based um, uh, score. Uh, I forgot what it's called in English. I think the uh, black uh, something. I, I forget. Anyway, uh, the thing is that these uh, tokens are not given to you as the result of an, an, a failure or a success or whatever. You actually... Um, uh, so th this is a game where you play uh, children in a, a world where adults have disappeared and it's a very dark and scary world. And so you actually pick these, uh, get these tokens every time your character uh, gets scared. But the thing is, 
it's not the GM who decides uh, when you get scared. It's it's yourself as a as a player. So you um, you have the choice as a player to take these tokens or not, which uh, they are going to help you in your roles. But at the same time, they mean that your character is more and more scared. So I think that that was a really cool way to you know combine. Um, the feelings of the of a character with a mechanic and also to let the, the players uh, choose themselves uh, how they want to to manage that rather than than the gm that, that's really something I, I i love and i i didn't really uh use that in my games but um it really inspired me to give more and more uh, control to the players in in even in games with with gms uh, you know, just to say to the players, okay, I trust you, you know your character better than me, so just do your thing, uh, tell me what works, and then I'll, I'll uh, work with that. That's a really interesting way to kind of uh, bundle risk-reward, but also uh, encouraging the player to take more control, and the, and the DM doesn't know either. That, that's really, um, mm -hmm. that's really uh, daring, I would say, in a really positive way. <laughs> That's cool. Thank, thank you for uh, sharing. Uh, Amelia, yeah. what is a, a noteworthy mechanic in TTRPGs you want to discuss from your own games or someone else you found, someone my, else you found noteworthy? My brain is stuck on that answer, mostly because you know that I also work on like fear as a mechanic. Oh, that's we see, can... that's that, that is when that is when mechanics that have to do with your character works is when they have an, a, a mechanized effect. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 that's how it works. But either way. <laughs> Um, okay, that's such a hard answer. I think I will give you like a breadth of like three quick answers, as okay. in like a mechanic that I think it's good from a game. I think it's really bad. A mechanic <laughs> from my game that I think it's really smart, and a mechanic that is just like I just love this. This is perfect, and it, and it, it sparks joy like my, like the Mario no matter. Okay, we're gonna keep it. The, the mechanic that sparks joy to me is uh, Rogue Trader's acquisition. As like, you, you, I hate in, in games in which micromanaging your inventory is important, and I do happen to enjoy. I don't write them, but I do enjoy them a lot. I have a spreadsheet for my bag of holding. I hate. I hate tracking down money. I think money is a really, it's a really outdated mechanic, and I love uh, games like Rogue Trader that give you money as a as a stat. Essentially, you have to roll your, uh, you have to roll under, you know, your ability of, to acquire something. Yes, perfect. Chef kiss. Um, mechanic I hate. I love from a game I hate. I, or, or rather, I think it's really bad. Uh, I love advantage. I think the N five E is. Not a good game, but I think advantage and disadvantage are the smartest idea that has ever been that has ever happened at Wizard of the Coast. I shamelessly mm -hmm. lift it and put it in every in all of my games, um, <coughs> and I don't and I don't apologize. <laughs> yeah, uh, don't. No, I won't. I will never. A uh, favorite mechanic that I use in my game that I kind of quote unquote invented is like. Splitting the party into into albs that get experience at the, uh, they get experience on a binary scale depending on depending on a binary uh, result. You know how in twelve you have humans and demons. The demons get experience when a human fails a fear test. The humans get it get it when they succeed. So there is a, there is there are two scales of XP: one for half the party and other for the other for the other half of the party, and they uh, happen. From as, as the result of a single roll. So every time a player is subjected to fear, there is half the party that's cheering and half the party that's dreading. And it it yeah, it has created such interesting play patterns. And it's it's it, it brings me great joy. It just brings me grand joy to to implement this mechanic whenever I can. Yeah, that I, I noticed that's a very clever way to bring together um, zero sum uh uh, rewards in the end, um, mm -hmm. especially when I think for a game like 12, you really need to have a, a safe place to do it. And I'm glad that our yeah. communities really uh, yeah, it is. encourage this environment in which to try these risky things, like letting your player determine 
whether they're scared or not, or one's mm -hmm. win is another's losses. Uh, Manfeld, noteworthy Manfeld. mechanic. Uh, the coolest mechanic, like right? the first uh, question. Okay, the coolest mechanic, not worth mechanic. I could say. At first glance, I am skeptic about that question because actually, I believe that not every mechanic can fit any concept of the game. Actually, not any okay. game. So, uh, but however, if I could say that most not working mechanics that I do like is the is the keys from uh, from uh, the Shadow of Yesterday by made by Clinton and Nixon, and then later developed by developed by. Uh, by Aero, Aero 12, 12 in, in the solar system and the keys mechanic, the keys, the keys are the, the script, the either motivation or dramatic well, themes of a character that uh, grants them some kind of the reward like uh, experience points in the original game. And then, and then asking the players what the play, what the player will do to get that reward actually. So, so it actually is about promoting being proactive in the game, in the, in the, during the session. Actually, and and the key itself has a has has its own uh, cr cr criteria about, uh, about criteria about how, how much XP you will get. For example, like for example, you get more XP for something more dangerous or more actually escalative or something like that. Uh, but also, keys has a has a has a another thing like call it all the offer. The offer works like that when when you encounter the. The something that actually is the opposite of the of the, of the exact team. For instance, if you are have a, the seduction key, and you encounter the possibility of uh, not 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 making a seduction or refusing somebody's attention during the scene, you can turn you can turn off the key by using the offer. Gets uh, a lot of XP and actually never ever pursuing that uh, that motivation. That motive to seduct people, to seduce people, actually. I think that the key, the, the key itself, an interesting way to actually engage the player in, into making improved story according to what they want actually to play. However, one down, however, one dies, uh, downside of, of the keys is that they need a player who really knows since the beginning what he wants to play. Actually, otherwise they, they are just inert actually. Yeah, they're a bit passive there. Now that really ties into what you said that one of the things that drew you to creating games was the ability to story create. So it really matches that one of your hero mechanics. I could mechanics. say that tarot and stick, uh, stick mechanics, actually. Yeah, but it matches very much. Especially that the, uh, the keys idea actually isn't actually dead in the TTRPGs. Like, for instance, uh, many PBTA games like A Dungeon World or Monster of the Week has a, um, uh, has a mechanics like if you roll six or, six or less, you get one XP. It's actually the hidden key mm -hmm. about uh, get, uh, getting engaged in something dangerous or risky. Exactly. Another example are another examples are Blades in the Dark and its uh, experience. In, I could say experience system in uh, either for the character or the crew, because the wording of that system is literally you are do, having experience points when you do something desperate, you <clears> have <throat> something like. Uh, when you do do you theme of uh, do you the thema, uh, topic of your uh, playbook and so on. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Manspels, for your uh, answer. Uh, we're going to take <laughs> one more broad question, and then we're going to go to a break, and then we're going to continue. But for that question, um, I think uh, something interesting for a lot of people who are wanting to develop games and deciding at what point do you stop decorating the cake you've been decorating for like an hour when do you stop when is it ready for play testing but um uh someone uh mentioned uh the the food um metaphor that once you know how to cook things once you know how ingredients work you can just kind of put things together with the recipe so uh my question to you actually is going to be um uh, can you dis discuss if the, if there have been uh, elements, ingredients, so to say, that from games that never saw the light of day, that you're like, I like this idea way too much. The original, I don't see a place for it, but I'm going to bring it and I have a place for it in a new game. Um, for example, I know Mansfeld, when I was doing my research, you mentioned on one of your blogs that um, you said maybe it's one of an, one of an unnecessary project. But the play set, play set itself was important for me. 
it helped me to fix October rust. I think for Kome, I think the supplements for other summers seem to be a continuation of the game. And Amelia's supplement for a cold tie from Inner Demons is definitely what sparked me to uh, consider that question. So uh, let's go. Uh, we're going to keep this a little shorter just to get the break on time, but uh, let's start with Matt's vote. I could say a short answer is that, the, in my opinion, the game is ready for playtesting when the the writing of the game stops being uh, the conspect and then become the instruction, actually. When they have uh, enough information for someone else than me, or the author, actually, some, uh, enough information for some, uh, for, from, than, uh, enough information to be understood by someone else, actually. Maybe they could not be fully understood or well understood, but they should provide enough information to act at, at least wonder about what author wants to, to say. Okay, so when a, when a third party independent set of eyes says, oh, this kind of makes sense and has some smart questions for you. <laughs> yes. Instead of just looking scared and uh... <coughs> sometimes that's a feature. Um, uh, going counterclockwise, Amelia. No, Your uh, mic is uh, muted, Carol. Yeah, the game is ready when you pitch it to me, which means the first minute of the of the of the meeting that we do to to <laughs> talk about it. And I know that this that this sound a little sounds a little um, aggrandizing. Well, let me explain. When you when we uh, wish and craft when we when we put out a game. When we uh, go to the rest of the crew and and, and ask, hey, uh, what about this game? Usually, most of the mechanics are already there. The fact is that, like, many of us spend so much time putting together mechanics, just as like as an just as a off time thing. That at the point in which we start pursuing a game seriously, we just go grab, you know, oh, we did this like two months ago, and this was like something that I thought for another system. Pop, 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 put them together. When this has not happened, the times that we actually try to do something uh, like making it up as it uh, as it went, it didn't work, and it became kind of a cemetery of mechanics that now we pull from to make other games. What I'm saying is that, like, the moment you want to work on this seriously, I really advise having like a lot of mechanics that you don't have a place for just float in there. And as soon as you pitch a game, you can look at them and be like, this, this, and this. These are perfectly, uh, this, this work perfectly in here, in here. And you need to know, like, how mechanically uh, involved is, in the, is this game? Cool. That's the amount of mechanics we need. Now, when you when you keep making it, you will probably add things as it goes. But the 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 bad, I think it's better when you start the game and you already have like the idea of what that game looks like. So you're basically like, every, if you're everything able to else is frosting. Pitch. Everything else is frosting. Okay, Koma, when is well, that game ready for playtesting? Uh, that, that's a that's an interesting question for me because, uh, as I said in my introduction, I started by uh, writing uh, very small RPGs. What what I did for two years uh, was to write uh, to release one game every month, which was usually between one and I think the longest I did was was ten pages, and uh, they were all over the map in terms of of ideas and, and mechanics and, and things. But um, this uh, uh, constraint of having a, a very you know, precise deadline, I need to have a new game out every month, meant that uh, I couldn't really uh, have the luxury of saying, okay, this doesn't really work, uh, I need to refine it, I need to spend 10 years on, on this idea and test it, uh, you know. Um, there are some games that I, that I pushed, like, okay, this is not ready, but uh, I pushed them like five five months later, you know. Um, and so that was kind of my training to realize that, um, you know, after a while you can trust yourself and you can say, uh, okay, I, I think, you know, I only did two play tests of this game, but uh, I trust myself that it works and that I can release it uh, as is. Um, but, but I needed this, this sort of experience before. 
Um, and to to answer your other question about uh, you know things that you don't use but you reuse them uh, later, um, that's not really something I do. But but what I do do is uh, reuse not not mechanics but in, in terms of just ideas concepts of, of games uh when i when i was uh created creating this this uh mini rpgs that i as i call them a full of of games ideas uh which didn't see the light of day and and some of them you know every once in a while i think back on them and i think oh yeah wait uh this idea i could i could finally use two years later for example Nice, nice. All right. One last thing before we go on our break. Uh, Amelia mentioned the word uh, pitch. Now, um, in the US, we have something termed the elevator pitch. It is you're riding in the elevator with the boss or the rich person who has the potential to fund your game. And the only attention span they have is the elevator ride up. So that's like less than a minute. So if we can take, I'm almost going to time it, a literal minute. Give me the elevator pitch for whatever game you're working on now. And after that, we're going to go to the break. So give people kind of, we talked about who you are, your process. We even talked about your games. So give me the elevator pitch, the 60 second pitch for your games. Who wants to go first? I can take it. All right. You have one minute on the clock. I, I don't even need to convince you because this game just convinces the, the current TTRPG community. This game literally has everything that the TTRPG community wants right now. <laughs> it, the rules are not too heavy, but there is plenty of die rolling for you dice gremlins. It's personal. It's deeply character driven. It speaks about real experiences. It's got cool demons and witches. I don't even need a minute to sell you this game. That was 40 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I'm sold. Perfect, here's my money. <laughs> Who wants to go next? Go ahead, Mansfeld, okay, you have so, a minute. Okay, October Rust is a game when I would recommend to play it when you want to be crushed by the game maker. <coughs> like, like, the, like, if you want to actually experience the green resources and and, and green resources and actually to, to get to that point when you make that final decision, either to sacrifice your character or moving on with being perished or actually not. Maybe not. Like that. And other thing, other things in October was led to that point. Or, or that depressing, maybe not depressing, but actually being forced to feel like depressing. Okay. All right, with uh, with twenty seconds to spare, and Kome. Okay, so my my latest game is Two Summers. It's about uh, living the the, the uh, two adventures with the same characters thirty years apart. So you play one group of uh, uh, characters are, uh, in their teen years during the summer, and then the same characters thirty years later as adults, um, discovering that their adventure is not quite finished. That there's there's some business that they need to take care of. The the original version of the game is is quite light. Uh, it's both a game about nostalgia and and you know this uh, kind of of light adventures that you were doing when you were a teen. Um, and so, yeah, that's about uh, human relationships, uh, getting together with your friends, having fun, uh, just just light, uh, cool, and, and funny uh, adventures. As the rich person on the elevator that I'll never be, I am broke because I have funded all your games. <laughs> um, there are some very Sweet. useful links in the chat where you can find out more about their games. We are going to continue the discussion, but some of us need to hydrate, stretch our legs, as do the rest of you. So we'll be back in five-ish minutes, maybe a little more. We're back when we're yeah. back. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Bring more people and we'll continue the discussion. So. Thanks. Bye.
Hello, hello. I hope you all can hear us. Thank you for coming back. Uh, just as a quick reminder, this wonderful panel was brought together by the amazing community of Ladies in D&D. And they are hosting a lot more panels just like this with different people, different moderators, different topics, and highlighting a lot of games as one shots and as small campaigns, all as part of their in December uh, events. So check them out on Twitter at, at Ladies of D&D. There's links for an amazingly, wonderfully chatty and fun uh, Discord. Um, and I hope to see you for the rest of the month. You'll definitely be seeing some of me, some of Amelia, and Mansford and Kome. I hope we all see you in the chat as well for all the other sure. events. Maybe some panels. There's so many sign up time. So, <laughs> um, we're going to go on for like hour plus ish. We're incorporating questions as we see them chat. So, thank you for being active participants. And uh, you know what? I'm going to jump a few questions I had. We had an interesting side uh, uh, discussion during the break. And it's something I want to bring up about uh, the demographics and who you're creating games for. Now, um, as the outsider looking in uh, indie games, especially TTRPG ones, seem to be very uh, niche, very focused on your communities. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, every person here on this panel represents a very different community whose primary language is not necessarily English at all. And um, the fact all most of your games are also primarily created in English. And correct me if I'm wrong, Kome, I think one of your games even had a Spanish supplement? Uh, it was translated into, into Spanish, actually, by, yeah. uh, by another publisher, yeah. Yes, but, but you're, you're a French person yourself, a Polish yes. person and an Italian person. So my question is, um, while you're creating these games, who do you envision your players to be? Even if you describe them physically, who are they? Where and what countries do they sit? What languages do they speak? So uh, let's, uh, let's just go with Kome and go uh, counterclockwise this way. Hmm. Who are my players? Um, well, I, I I have this group of maybe it's it's grown over the years. I would say 10, 12 people who I play with and who are just amazing players and some of them creators actually. And I think I think most of them, if I'm honest with myself, uh, most of them are the, the target I have in mind when I create games. Um, you know, I'm not going to be so so. Uh, to go as far as to say I create games for myself, but yeah, I create games for them because the games I create are the games I, I like to play. Um, and so, uh, of course, if, if, if other people like it, that, that's, that's good as well. Um, but yeah, other than that, I, I, I once was um, uh, talking with, an, uh, I think, an American uh, RPG player the other day uh, about uh, the French RPG scene, if I if we can call it a scene, and uh, what what's really too bad is that uh, we have a lot of amazing games uh, which don't exist in English because the the creators don't speak the language, um, and so. But but I think um, I, I I don't think there's a particular sensibility to to French games that you can't find in other indie scenes uh, because we've been influenced by uh, the American scene for quite a while now, including in, in, in the uh, uh, RPGs. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when I, what's interesting for me is that um, I, as you said, I publish games in, in two, the two languages, uh, French and, and English, and um, many, well, I, I mean, people know me uh, more or less on the French uh, scene. Uh, if I if I publish a game, I will have some reactions from uh, people from French people. Uh, not so much for on, on the English speaking scene. Even if uh, when I kickstart a game, for example, uh, most of the money comes from uh, the USA. Uh, so it's really strange because uh, you know for for from. Um, uh, it seems like uh, most the, most of the people who play my game are English speakers, but most of the people who talk about my games are French speakers. So I don't really know why that is. Ah, I have an answer. Yeah, <laughs> tell me. 
All right, people we'll go, we'll go to Amelia just, to answer overall as well. I think a lot of people in the US just buy games to have them and never play them. Oh, but that's the case in France, in France as well. <laughs> I we don't mean, talk about that because I just go back to playing D&D &D after that. Yeah, I don't know. I am sorry, that was a little, a little, a little <laughs> salt, a little side of salt there. Just, 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 just. <laughs> but no, but I do think that a lot players. of people, I do think that a lot of people in the, like, specifically in the US, like to buy more games than they actually end up playing. I don't really. Either That's way, why I stopped uh, playing uh, TTRPGs because I just want to play, uh, buy those games that I want to actually play. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> yeah, I don't maybe like cheap PDFs or like something. Yeah, I don't like having games that I don't play, mostly because I am not well off enough to buy a bunch of things that I don't use. Um, either way, what do, who do I make games for? I like I like answering this question when when it is more than me because I can just point at pro one and be like. Born, that one of the people that work with me because it's kind of true and let me explain that um i don't make games that are explicit that are extremely italian because my team is not italian like my team is me and rowan is from the uk and then we have uh victoria who's from uh the us but her family is uh southern south american i think with like a Basque ascendancy, and then we have Show, who's half Native American, half Irish. So, as you see, kind of all of us come from very different places. And so, I think that, like, that regionalism is thankfully lost. If, I agree. If, if the, only, the, only, the only thing that's cool about that is that we can, like, supply weird myth mythological stuff. And that's cute. Uh, who do we make games for is... Well, that depends, because mechanically, I don't make game for myself. Not usually. I am making finally one. I'm making Witch Mac, which is the first game I make mechanically for people like me. But in general, I tend to, to keep it a little lighter than what I like, because I want to snare everyone. I make my games for as many people as I can mechanically. I want people that never play a TTRPG to be able to play my games, but I also want people who play them for 10 years to come into my game and look at it and be like, ah, well, that's cool. I can do something with that. That's new. Flavor-wise, I think we definitely are slanted towards uh, towards kind of like our age of progressively minded people, essentially. Um, I'm 27. The rest of the team is between 22 and 28. And don't look at me like that. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> I'm uh, a except, except Ek, who's 34, she's honorary a a uh, a um, a Witchcraft member. But in general, we tend to make games for the um, for the kind of demographic that we represent. That is like young, like millennial, uh, millennial. Uh, slash zoomer kind of people who have a uh, rather progressive outlook on like social and cultural issues and we attempt to make it very clear in our games this game are not friendly to a certain kind of people so we don't we don't want that don't... it's the classic like fascists don't need to buy my game you know I don't need their money, and that's uh, that is uh, that is a thing that we that, that I, I hope it's kind of clear with the games that we do. So just uh, buy to collect it anyway, like you said. Yeah, uh, yeah. In general, I guess that's that's our demographic. It's people like us because we understand people like us and we can relate to people like us. Okay. Thankfully, a good chunk of the TTRPG community happens to be people like us, young qu young queers. <laughs> I'm holding up a mirror to a camera with a light that makes no sense. Anyway, Mansfeld, who are your players? What do the, what do you envision? Uh, actually, look like? I didn't aim it at particular demographic. I aim it more about that making the games. I mean, particularly one main game, but actually all two of games to make to make accessible to to somebody who to everyone, including especially someone who didn't play it in TTRPG game, game session or whatever. Actually. I wanted to play the game that can be played without any bias, except of, uh, okay, everyone has his own bias, but, 
but uh, that that game in general, to, in order to be started, it doesn't need to be other bias than just well reading the pages during the prep action, so like that. And essence, I thought about it, especially October was about making the game that that actually uh, for someone who, who wants to be well compelled by the game that want to actually play not your, not mine, or ever else the game, to want to play the game itself, actually. To experience the how the game uh, how the game works, actually, how the game leads and uh, uh, propose the player, as propose, how, how it makes the player, actually. So I'm interested in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the people playing who wants to uh, experience the, I could say, instruction itself, actually. What, what, what is, what is, be what is between the interaction of instruction and the user section? So it's what comes by using the instruction. What what are the effects of that? Because I think that making a game, actually making a game, is a game is actually is kind of a social con control. Action. We control the people by making games and uh, forcing them to do certain things. Like in, for instance, safety tools. I, I I put the entire pages in October as for the safety tools. Mostly to ensure people that the game will, will bring some the hard topics like depression, uh, sacrifice of your character, depressed, uh, rainy ra ra weather, or sins of the past, and etc. And I wanted to ensure that if you want to play October Rust, you need to accept that people have their own boundaries and, and you need to care about each other because the game will not care about you. And so I think it's a care. fair generalization to say that, to bring together Amelia's point. I'm not having points. My points are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we can't okay. hear you anymore. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I, it's misbehaving every now and then, sorry. All right, all right. Um, uh, let me repeat. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> my brain short circuited a bit. Um, yeah, Mans Ma thank God for my notes. Uh, Man Mansfeld says that um, he wants his games to kind of um, introduce or make players face these kind of things like um, internal thoughts, be they darker, be they more noir, be they almost depressionary words with you. Uh, I could say more, more in general to exp the force to experience something, actually. Some, something deeper. And I think what Amelia was saying earlier is that the kind of games that she makes are games for younger progressives of our uh, age group, let's say, generously. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so yeah. and maybe it's a generalization to say that uh, this newer generation, our current one, and our peers immediately are a bit more uh, open to that, are a bit more open to challenging preconceived notions. I think that's why the so. generalization of, oh, hey, boomer, who doesn't want to deviate from their previous beliefs and they're very hard fast. Like Amelia said, these games are definitely uh, really not for them. But at the same time, you say you want to make it for newcomers. Is there any way you think, I open think question, we, any way think... to get uh, non fans in, or it's not a yeah, quite worth no, it's happening. easy. It's easy. The fact, the fact is this newcomers usually need someone to intro them, but we luckily live in a, at a point in which TTRPGs are starting, are starting to be sort of mainstream. Now, the, the problem is that when I say TTRPGs are mainstream, I mean that the TTRPGs made by a certain company was a lot of money and can can advertise like hell is very popular right now that said that doesn't mean that we don't get to like steal from uh, from their uh from their audience but in yes. general i feel like every time i talk to someone who's never even played the, the game with the dragons <laughs> and be like yeah i make public ttrpgs would you be interested in trying I don't remember like someone of my age who told me like from from some of my community center that I used to uh, hang around quite a lot that uh, that ever told me like no that sounds silly like they were they were like yeah that sounds interesting and cool mostly actually I don't want to make it a gender discussion because but uh, everything about the Amelia is a gender discussion I suppose. But a lot of it, a lot of it happened in like a rather, um, a, a rather feminist outlook, a rather feminist group. I feel like 
in general, girls and like uh, non binaries are like more likely to go for it. The, the biggest resistance I get is usually from like dudes, maybe just because they think it's like uncool to play the to play the game with the miniatures until you explain to them. But as soon as they try, it's 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 gone. So like we are yeah, we are winning the against that. Who we are winning the game against... with the dragons are are, are cis yeah. white men. Yeah, we are winning the, the we are winning the war against toxic mas masculinity. I I assure you, it's it's yeah. going well. <laughs> it's a beautiful tent with happiness in yeah. any every flavor, and everyone is welcome who wants yeah. to be there. And uh, and also, um, I if I can add something, yes. I um, uh, so so in the high school where I teach, I studied um, I studied. Uh, a games club yes. uh which which initially started as a as a board game club but i you know quite quietly and discreetly uh brought more and more rpgs to the table without saying anything and, and, cool teacher. and yeah and so some some of the teenagers were like oh what's this where can i can we play etc and so the the games i i brought to the table were really varied in terms of um, you know, uh, the, the proposition, uh, nothing mainstream, just indie, strange, weird things. Um, and the thing is, with, with I think with new players, we're too, we're, we're generally too afraid. Um, you know, we're, we're going to, we, we shouldn't think, oh, this is uh, too niche, this is too strange, uh, they're not going to like it, etc. And I think that's the same thing with the games we create. Um, we shouldn't restrain uh, us ourselves by saying, okay, I cannot or I should not include this because no one's going to uh, respond to this or it's not going to sell well enough, etc. Um, yes, we're a niche uh, market, but I think there are enough <laughs> there are enough weird weirdos uh, interested in, in these sort of things that we can we can just you know offer offer stuff that's new and, and innovative. And also, uh, I think there's more and more people who just, uh, you know, they are not interested in, in Dungeons and Dragons. They're interested in, in RPGs, but they don't want the fantasy uh, or uh, superhero uh, mainstream thing, because Bigger now man. now we have this in movies, now we have this in, yeah. in books, in series. It's, so, it's passe, it's too cool now. Now it's yeah. just like the way Facebook went to our parents and our aunties. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not just a question of too cool, oh, it's also, oh. it's also if, you, if you need this, uh, if you need this in your... Uh, as, as an imaginary world where you can uh, uh, escape, uh, you already have movies and, and series to do that. Whereas, uh, if you need to um, hunt demons or if you need to, you know, whatever, there's, there's, uh, uh, the only place to do this is in the RPGs. So, I think that's the, the, the fact that we create games that are uh, unique and, and strange and innovative are more an asset than a weakness. I, I completely Big agree, and everywhere. I think that the uh, company with the dragons, because that's what we're calling it now, <laughs> I think takes. I don't. I don't. I'm not the authority to say this, but I'm just going to say it now. I think they. A lot of the changes that they're making toward inclusivity, uh, the indie TTRPGs were there first. Amelia oh, was yeah. mentioning in Always an earlier answer that, that uh, what she makes, what she feels makes her games good, are the insertion of herself and the insertion of the diverse people around her. And as a form of as escapism, as diverse people, <laughs> as people in minority groups, underrepresented groups, uh, that is a better. Uh, it's, it's more fantastical to be the brown girl with power than to be the elf with the magic wand. Yeah, totally. I, uh, I'm not, well, not sure about that, but and that reality yeah, is like else, amazing. But, uh, <laughs> I, you know what? I feel like it's more easily just like we are starting as a as a, um, starting uh, as a generation to realize how cons constricted and alienated from our passions we are. From you know, I don't want to say the word with a C, but I'm, I'm going to say capitalism in general. Like we are our fantasy our creativity is killed every day and i think the rpg has come to absolutely come to the rescue when it comes to that they definitely allow the like the ability to evade to create to invent that is like so important to retain 
yeah, we, we do we do God's work. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, God's work has to be spread, or whoever's work has to be spread uh, far and wide, especially in this day, day and age God. where because it's a pandemic and we can't all come to the table as often uh, anymore. Uh, so my next question, the segue is, as uh, in-person playing becomes more difficult, how much development time do you give uh, to online tools and digital tools? Uh, like, for example, modules for Roll20 or something. Uh, I know, for example, Mansfeld has uh, provided Google Docs with uh, the games that he's developed. So why don't we start with Mansfeld and go counterclockwise around the table there? Okay, sadly, I didn't develop any uh, Roll20 or a Foundry module for both of the games. However, yes, I decided to develop develop the, uh, the Google Sheets for October as first because first of all, I made the playtest in online. So I needed something that to to either have the character sheets or actually the adventure list, actually. So Google Sheets are well, very handy way or not trying to circum circumvent the wheel of in the Roll20, actually, to make actually need just, well, this Discord dice, dice roller and the Google Sheets, actually. And in this accessibility, I think, how, however, I think that I could put something, do more something about it, about being more, about making the game more accessible for online users. For instance, I could actually, I could say, think about, uh, I would want to say, uh, okay, I, I, I lost in the mind actually what I wanted to say in, in, in the end. It happens, I know firsthand. He was uh, there do you want, and then you want to take a minute? I can go back to someone and come back to you, okay. or do you think you're going to get it in 30 seconds? Okay, maybe let's do the other person. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's just go diagonal to Kom. Um, well, so I I don't really include. Uh, I wish uh, I should include more more tools to to play. Uh, my games online. That's something I I wanted to do. Well, I think yeah. For for one of my latest games, I included actually uh, an online generator uh, to 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 just uh, click a button and get uh, dozens of prompts. But but yeah, usually I don't. However, um, I also uh, have been playing online for for years now. Before the pandemic uh, hit, actually, because before that there was also the. Uh, uh, the, the, the great uh, and sad uh, going away of friends who, with whom I, I used to play RPGs with. So most of my games have been online. And so when I write a game, it's usually, um, in my mind, uh, first meant to be played online and then maybe around the table. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I think, um, I don't remember for which one, but there was one of my games where I really wrote it for playing online and then uh, someone contacted me and said, but I, I need to, I want to play this around the table. And yeah. so uh, for this part, how do I do it? Because I cannot do it online. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, maybe I've done things backwards. I don't know. Um, but but yeah, uh, I it, so there's not a, a specific tool, but it's more like the general uh, playability of it online uh, in mind. So no, uh, uh, yeah, you know, not nothing too physical or too material. Although I I love games where you have to uh, rip up uh, pages and staple them, etc. I'm I'm not doing that because I I won't be able to do it online. Uh, just to piggyback is what you mentioned that someone asked for an in-person version versus what you prepared on uh, content meant to be played online, uh, having never developed a game. Uh, is that something that is a parallel track? Is that like a completely different setup uh, lane of development to consider uh, in-person and online capabilities for a game? Um... I'm, no, I, d I don't think so. Maybe for very specific mechanics, like you've got the uh, Jenga Tower in, in Dread, for example, where if, if you know, uh, on, you cannot do this online, obviously, so you will need to think about another way of doing it that, that retains this idea of, uh, well, uh, uh, growing Dread and, and the thing that you, s you know you're going to fail at one point, but when? Um, but other than these very semi, uh, physical types of, of mechanics, I can't I can't think of, of something. For for my example, I you know I just um, just sold of something real quick and, and uh, gave this person a, 
an equivalent of, of how to do it. Um, it was it was actually the, the the mechanic in question was was a, a randomizer, like you had to to search for an image on on Google uh, mm -hmm, images mm -hmm. and, and and find something. And so I said, uh, you know, just pick. A, a, I think I don't remember. I think a guidebook of some sort. Uh, take a photo in in there, and that would be you know not the same, but but similar. Um, but that's that's really a unique case. Generally, I think what 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 works online also works uh, in real life, and vice versa. Uh, I think well for my games, uh, at least. I don't know for for other people's. Okay, thank you for your answer. Mansfield, did the thought come back to you? Otherwise, we'll jump to Amelia. Okay, if it comes Amelia. back to you later and uh, the heavens have opened up and dropped it into your brain, as my <laughs> first grade teacher often said, let me know. Um, Amelia, how much development time, if all, do you give for uh, enhancing online play specifically of your games? I'm going to put on my hipster glasses and say that in general, I do think that the book, the physical book, the physical thing is really important in TTRPGs and I develop mostly for the idea that you're going to play it in person. That said, the fact is that most of the games I develop tend to not have um, physical items that you need and if they do, they're like tokens that you just need to you for, for yourself to remember, essentially. Like, I will definitely make um, PDF uh, sheets that you can edit, because that's useful, but that's not just limited to the online. Um, I will definitely make, as we had, um, as we as we did with uh, with 12, thanks to Jenna, actually, uh, like, a, an alternative PDF that is, like, more friendly uh, for, like, uh, dyslexic readers, just to make sure, you know. That said, I don't really think any of the games that I made are particularly announced by like um, online features. And also, I'm not a programmer, and we don't really, and we can't really afford like a programmer. Because the only thing in twelve that I might see like being important is like if you could create a program that does the uh, the distance trader for you. But that's such a small thing that I don't I don't believe it's like important, and it's also not easy enough to program that I can attempt to do it myself. So realistically, didn't ask it, don't need it, you know? That's what theater of the mind is for the, as well. The basics, the basics are there and like the, when it comes, you know, when it comes to accessibility, that's a thing. Yes, obviously all the kinds that we can do. If it, if it, you know, like different versions of the game in PDF form to be more accessible. Yes, absolutely. An actual like online only feature, I don't think it's. I don't. I don't care. Other people make giant sites just to accommodate for that, and they actually know how to program. So, like, I like to play the, the big shot. Right now for you, Amelia. I like to play the big shot developer. Yeah, no, uh, on it, on it, on it. I have an idea. <laughs> I remember idea. it about that. At some point, I thought about how to make the game that isn't reliant any on words, but on the pictures. Like, for instance, I got inspired by some of the SCP, SCP monster, which is written entirely in the dots or like in the, in the <coughs> diagrams or pictures, because in, according to the lore, everyone mentions by verbally, like by voice or by, by written, something written about that monster, the monster arrives and destroys that information. Possibly with a user or not, but information in general. So the only way to preserve information about that monster is to, to is to not write about it, not speak about it, to write uh, pictures, diagrams, dots, and etc. So to the point of, I thought about sometimes at making October Rust about like in just the diagrams, without uh, numbers. I mean numbers. I mean uh, I mean Arabic numbers. I'd say yeah, yeah. Without, uh, without without any languages uh, except of just actually the 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 graphs, diagrams, and pictures speaking itself. Entire instruction to write it this way, to be actually and uh, actually to, to, which the game in result would would not need any language to actually understand any language except of actually you can say. I'm not a linguistic, because, so I don't know what, what the term for that language is, 
But I could say that is not a language in terms of, well, modern linguistics. Yeah, sort of transcends language if you're just kind of communicating. Yes. How do you understand the picture, actually? How do you yeah, feel that exactly. picture? How do you want to do with that information presented of the pictogram or maybe not even not pictogram, actually, because it is already written something. It's more like, for example, how do you understand, interpret uh, like the table of the obstacles in October Rust, which would be written not by numbers and words, but more like dots and, well, some scenes uh, uh, drawing on. If you ever get like feedback from different communities, different uh, on different countries, languages that try that out, I think that'd be really uh, interesting. To how the game is played according to the instruction being interpreted by the pictures. Exactly. That, that that's really uh, interesting. <laughs> Let's see. Let me juicy questions. Yes, uh, we we kind of touched on this uh, earlier in some of our discussions. Um, I think, uh, especially Amelia and, and Kope brought it up as well. But my question is, uh, how much, if at all, do industry trends kind of uh, influence your game creation? Um, for example, we talked about the company with the dragon. That we like it or not, Let's personally. Let's say company with our Komodo. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it has been, um, how to say, uh, it's, it's widened the door and more people have come in in the end. But at the same time, the expectations are very much uh, already predetermined by said company with the dragon, with the ampersand. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's go the other way around. So Mansfeld, how much do industry tends, if at all, influence your game creation? I could say a lot because the entire entire I could say a lot because before before I actually started to make any one game, including to those not published at all, I mean some few Polish in Polish but not published. Yeah, uh, it influences a lot because uh, first of all I look at upon how, for instance, that saw the shadow of yesterday or Burning Wheel or Apocalypse World or Blazing Dark has been designed. So I try to put it how they how those authors like Mr. Baker, like, like, like Bakers, like John Harper, like Jason Morningstar, like Mr. Nixon, how what they actually were doing in order to have uh, such results. And to conclude that that answer, I could say that uh, actually I would consider myself more like an idea uh, idea stealer, more like, like an, actually anything else actually. So I want to try to actually just, uh, just uh, if I want to anything invent anything, I want to actually just to invent new ways of using something that was already done. Actually. Thank you very yes. much, uh, Amelia. The industry can go at itself, <laughs> un unless I am specifically making a point, <laughs> like. Like it's uh, some time ago, we attempted, we didn't finish it, but we attempted Project Zero, which was a game that I hope that we can still pick up later, uh, which is a game about uh, people with superpowers, but not superheroes. Mm -hmm. And definitely the idea came because of how popular, you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is getting. But the entire idea of that of that game was like showing, showing up what we think is like the big hypocrisy of superheroes and why and what we think would be like a a more proper use of your of your abilities should should you be able to, sh to sh shoot fire from your hands so when it comes to being counterculture i guess i guess you would say that sometimes we look we look at it but in general we attempt to make things that are like Without really thinking about like, is this is this pop culture relevant? You know, is this relevant in the in the industry? Because that's like uh, just putting yourself in the in the in the mechanism, and you're just going to end up making extremely soulless content just for the hell of it. In like, I have been sometimes approached with like, hey, you should if you want to grow your numbers, you should do this and this, and it's like, yeah, all that's very cool and all, but I I would rather. Uh, I would rather keep doing the things that I think is good, and you know, not sell my soul and alienate myself from my passion. Just, 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 just cause. What I I'm can't saying wait is, to I'm see ready. See your to... mobile uh, battlegrounds game, then. What I'm going to say is, I'm fully ready to die at 35, starving if I have to. <laughs> Hydration check. Thank you, Schneisela. 
for the hydration and check. And how dare you check me? How dare you vibe check me <laughs> on the water? Um, then we have uh, Corme. How much, if at all, do industry trends influence your game creation? I think it's interesting for you because you mentioned earlier that uh, the instruction direction came from above with deadlines. So uh, how, how, how do you answer that? Yeah, I mean, big big trends, uh, not at all. I mean, I I don't read them, I don't play them. I'm I'm not interested in them. I'm, uh, I think. Well, maybe okay. The only thing that interests me with with mainstream RPGs is that if they bring someone new to the medium, that I can then um, sort of of convince that in fact it's not uh, mainstream that they are looking for, but the little indie uh, strange thing. Um, so, but then it it gets it gets difficult with uh, the games that we've been mentioning so far, like like uh, Apocalypse World, for example. Is it uh, because it's at the the corner between mainstream and indie? It's maybe like the the most mainstream of of indie RPGs, and in in this sense, it's it's hard it's harder to ignore because uh, it's brought not only new mechanics and but also new ways of of playing, of thinking about. Uh, the roles of of uh, a GM of players, etc. So, uh, I think that subconsciously, maybe these sort of big mainstream games I I have in in you know the background of my mind as I create games. But um, yeah, other than that, I mean, uh, and, and to to tie back to what I was uh, saying before. Uh, if I can't steal it, <laughs> I'm not really interested in it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. That that's really Why? not something, not not something I I think about when I when I create or when I play. Um, that's not to say that I, I I hate the mainstream or I I wish they can all go to 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 hell. Uh, some some mainstream games are are cool, and I you know I started with that. So uh, yes, but um, yeah. I mean, I, I started with it. I still like it more or less. <laughs> oh my god! Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's not really something I uh, that's uh, in the center of my mind nowadays. Okay. If Thank we made mainstream that. games, we wouldn't be indie game creators, would we? I, I wouldn't be sitting here with you having yeah. this wonderful discussion with discussion. you. <laughs> I mean, it's it's one thing to for me to walk through the door. Ah, oh, no, oh, it's a... <laughs> there you go. Damn, ah. it's the opposite. Oh. It's one thing to walk through the door as someone following mainstream trends myself, and it's another thing to you to see me like, "Ooh, Ida, you look nice. I'm going to steal you now, and mm -hmm. please steal me, steal people like me, steal everyone who has that bit of curiosity and has taken that leap." Because the mainstream, I think, does the job of filtering out who is willing to take the leap at all. Um, we have a really interesting question from yet another bard, and we, we briefly touched on this, but it doesn't go, uh, yeah, thank you, ladies of the Indies. Uh, we briefly touched on the, uh, the, the communities we represent, the nationalities, the languages. Uh, Kong, for sure, you publish your games in French. But correct me if I'm wrong, Amelia, does 12 have Italian translations officially published? It doesn't, and do you know why? Yes, we want to. Because <laughs> uh, the, the Italian person on your team, being me, has a lot of work to do on, on all our games and can't really take time to do an Italian translation. And we don't really have like the, the ability to get someone to make an Italian version of it. Because I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you finish your question, <laughs> but the answer is a little bleak. It's, 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 it's building up. No, uh, I, I know the answer because I've seen the question and it's yeah, not yeah. a great answer. I, I wanted to ask uh, Mansfield as well, do your your games, are they published in Polish? You have English no. language games. No, they are Actually, not. Actually, no. I cannot no. say about something. <laughs> Come again? Okay, uh, okay, so can I speak some, something about Pilism in Polish? Well, the, the, the question to the answer you're about to give from yet another bard is how do you feel about these kind of situations if they affect your work and do you try to reach out to more countries or maybe to swing it back to what we're discussing, your own countries, your own communities. So uh, go ahead Mansfeld, then Amelia, then Cole. 
so kind of... I could say that I didn't intend to make my games in Polish because first of all I wanted to focus more on the rest of the world actually, not just mm -hmm. Americans, not British people, or Canadian people, or other Anglophones. I wanted to visit the rest of the people with this game because it's uh, first of all bigger market and it's the second for all. Okay, maybe I could some some anecdote like that. If you're making the indie the tabletop indie RPG. You are not competing with wizards of other, you know, traditional RPG publishers. Okay, maybe you are competing in the, in, say, social movement level, but not in the marketing level. Okay. Like that. You are not competing with that. Because they are actually different things, actually. Not just uh, too, too much to be competitors, but just are actually different things. Different, uh, yes, yeah, different things. However, in Poland, if you are making indie uh, role-playing game, you are competing with not only other few uh, in the creators, you are competing with everyone who makes TTRPGs, including including somebody who translated D and D fifth edition. I'm uh, sorry for saying that. Underground and Komodo first edition, like like, Re like Rebel or like or somebody who uh, who, who, who translates uh, the the Warhammer Fantasy role playing since the fifth years so, and so on. You are competing with everyone. You you are judged by everyone. Your products are judged by, against everyone. So. Not not by standards of the indie creators' standards, I would say, more against standards like translated uh, Tasha Cauldron of of and of uh, nobody or something like that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, to be fair, if if your standard is Tasha, we are doing golden because that book is rubbish. <laughs> yes, I mean this is the point of this. It's just I could say it's not worth it to compete when you when the already the expectation for any indie RPG the creator are so high in Poland. Okay. You rather be a normal sized fishy with other normal sized fishies <laughs> without the sharks. I mean, I wanted to actually have a space of development to get to, to maybe higher level. And actually, being, I mean, it's, it's less about the ambition, it's more about the set bar actually, mm -hmm. initially. So, in order to be in Poland kind of recognizable, I'm oh, sorry. I should, I should turn to another person. I'm not really sure, something secret is going on here. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, sure. I'm gonna talk. <laughs> um, so I disagree that we are not that we are not in the same in the same pool as the shark, and I'm going to tell you why. Cause the big the big sharks still use Kickstarter to sell their games. Like when the Avatar TTRPG uh, was made uh, a few months ago. It's it was not an indie game yet. It went through Kickstarter. All the big game, v the VTM books, go through Kickstarter. Everything goes to Kickstarter, even when the people that make it clearly have the money to make it. They don't need it. They just use it as a way to like pro sell the content. So yes, we are in the same in the same uh, bat as all the sharks. We are competing with the big ones, regardless of where you go. Now I really hate to talk about competing and market and stuff. It's something that I this that I if I could if I could make my games for free and just give them to whoever wants them and not think about the market and having to sell them, that would be the happiest camper. That said, we do have to actually because because apparently we have decided that, that as a society that can, in fact, sustain everyone, we have decided that somehow you still don't have any rights to leave if you don't make money, which is beyond me. But since this thing is, is real, it's really hard to get a game going as an indie game developer. If I have to also start making translations, when it's really hard to sell the English version, which is, the, which is going to be like uh, obviously the best selling version because most people speak English, it's just a matter of fact. Look, I would love nothing more than to have like an Italian version, a French version, a Spanish version, a Mexican Spanish version, damn it. Who's, I don't want to ask people to make them for free because that is rubbish. And then I am there in a situation where like, well, we made ten thousand dollars with the with the with the um, with the Kickstarter of this book. I need to split some of them among the people that work at Witch and Craft Games because they need food. Uh, I need a lot of them to go to actually print in the books. Uh, 
some of them will be taken, in fact, by the printers. And some of them we need to like make to like send copies to reviewers who aren't even like buying them. We send them the copies. Like the fact is that if I could get them translated, I would. And like if you you know what we what would be super cool and I've seen someone do this is like people actually attempting to put together like community of like community directed to translating indie games into like uh, less mainstream languages in that English. And I think that's one of the coolest thing ever. And if people want to do it and we will put together like a community that is that it, that does that, not for free. I'm not even saying for free. Sign up in the chat. But like a community that allows um, that allows indie content creators to have like a place to go and be like, look, I need this game done in this language, and have people be like, yes, I can do that. Honestly, you're solving so many problems if you can do that. Let's take the perspective from someone who does have um, a game uh, in more than just English in the language or the community that they're native to, so Kwame. Well, so um, I, I'm yeah, I'm lucky to to have my games be uh, well successful. Is probably not the word, but but they work. They they sell. On they're received. The, right, they're received. Yes, thank you. In the two languages that are French and, and English, uh, but that's because, uh, as I said before, uh, I you know the, the French the French scene is is active. I I some people know me in this scene and so uh and so that's how it works and also uh contrary to amelia for example i don't consider uh, making ttrpgs my living uh, i have uh, you know a main job and so the the pressure of the the money is is, is less important for me uh, which is really important to consider um uh, and and then yeah to talk about the, the translations um we also are lucky in friends that there are a lot of of uh, uh, people who like to translate games into french and to ask creators if they can make uh, unofficial translations of, of games that that's something that that uh, is redone a lot uh, here and so of course uh with that and, and the fact that uh, I'm, I'm talking about stealing from games, uh, I've been talking about it for, for two hours. Uh, you know, if someone wanted to do an unofficial translation of my games, uh, by all means, go ahead. That would be that would be great. Uh, that would be a great honor. Um, so but but yeah, I mean, um, when I when I write, I don't think I consider, um, you know, I, I don't think I'm, I'm writing uh, with a, in my mind, okay, I need. Uh, there, there's no. Ha, let me let me back up. Um, yeah. When I when I create a game, I don't uh, do it uh, in with one language in mind. For me, it's always French and English at the same time. Sometimes I start in English and I, I then translate the game in French. Sometimes it's the other way around. Uh, but but uh, it's also because uh, I can do it myself uh sing you know as my, my uh, i i don't do it perfectly because i'm not completely bilingual but i can i can write in both languages uh i'm a one-man operation save for the occasional uh, layout artist or or uh, uh, illustrator that i that i hire so uh yeah i think basically once you take money out of the equation or once money is not the primary concern when you're making a game you can allow yourself these types of, of decision and that's really a privilege of course um, and if you don't uh, have this privilege I think it's very logical that you start to English because that's where the money is um, uh, having worked in localization and localization management it is a beast uh, there is a much higher thought process uh, rather than just transliterating words one to the other localization includes uh nuances that aren't explicit in the language oh, so uh, some much. of these nuances are regional they are beholden to the language and do not translate to other languages so it is very much an extensive labor one worth paying well for and mm. i really can uh, uh empathize with that uh kind of sentiment um, yeah. Kome, like, uh, your I, advice... I like 
Yes. Mm, sorry, yeah. sorry. No, like, go I, ahead, got two, I got two. Uh, I got the, the luck to have like two people that write for me, like the, especially the flavor, because <coughs> rule set. That's just mostly rules. But like, I have two people that write just the flavor for our games, and like, they are extremely talented, and they really go for like, often some quite extensive research on what they do in English. Yeah. That, that and translating that, that translating hard. that that's hard that's extremely mm -hmm. hard like you can't chip skate i as an artist i always say like don't chip skate artists and like you can't chip skate translators either <laughs> so coma how did your game come to a spanish translation was that requested was that just like a pet project of someone that was uh, pure luck. I still don't know how it happened. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I was so lucky with this. Uh, what happened is that I kickstarted uh, two summers back uh, in February for the latest uh, edition of uh, ZineQuest. And then uh, I guess somehow a Spanish uh, publisher got a word of it, or maybe one of the people working there was a backer. I don't know. They just sent me an email saying, "Oh, we we like your game. We want to publish it," and and that's how it happened. I mean, I I have no other explanation than than this. And uh, yeah, I was I was so lucky. Yeah, when someone publishes you, obviously it's way it's way different because they handle all of this, right? That's right. Yes, when you, was... when you self-publish, it's it's all on you. Well, uh, but the um, uh, to 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 the that's uh, that that translation um, uh, saying into Spanish is relevant to our conversation about localization because oh, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. for the for the, the the English version, so so two summers takes place in in small country villages, and so in the French version and the in the English version, I tried to um, uh, as, as we said. The, as we just said, to change the uh, cultural uh, uh, localization of the game, because a, a small country uh, city in, in France is not the same as in the USA, yeah. obviously. Yeah, um, and they didn't do that for the Spanish version. I think they, they kept the English uh, version of the game. So the, the Spanish version of the game uh, takes place in the United States, basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I thought that was, you know, that that's interesting. That's probably not how I would have done it, but uh, but I understand also why they did it because, uh, as we said, it's such a it would have been such a pain to just think about all the nuances and the and the things you you need to change. And it's not just the names of the towns; it's also, yeah. um, and that's also why I, I would be very curious to to see how two summers. Uh, you know, is played in Japan or in, in the Philippines, for example, to take two countries where I know that people have bought it. Um, I, I'm really curious about how your culture would infuse in, in playing a game like this. I actually have a really thing that kind of went to my mind, but like, sure. I think it would be interesting if people, but like, in, if indie creators started setting up, started setting up in their Kickstarters, like, uh, goals, goals going towards translations. Mm -hmm. I think that I, will help. That will help I wonder a lot. About... You know what? I, I'm gonna do it for for Kotai and the first and the first goal I'm setting is for a Basque translation. Fuck everyone. Mm. Nice. Love, you were saying. Love, love the Basque country. Love my Basque. Uh, I wonder about how do you look like uh, October Rasput would look like in uh, in the Polish because first of all I didn't make any sentence or word in in Polish while making this game. Entire, mm -hmm. entire, entire, entire making, uh, process making through the concept and the draft to the final way, it was involved, was written entirely in English, and I specifically wanted to focus to unpolish the game. I mean, how is it right to? Yeah, I yeah. mean, there is a phenomenon in Poland called Ponglish. It means like yeah. speaking, speaking English by using English words but using Polish grammar. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, so. So, uh, so I wanted to actually depolish the game as, poly, <laughs> as possible. So in, in essence, I wanted to translate the October Rust in the Pol to Polish. I would need to actually the, literally translate the entire game to make the Polish again. I mean, not again, to actually make the Polish because it never was Polish, at least by the, by, by, by the written part of it. Yeah, by its creation. Uh... So, so, Go ahead, finish your thoughts. Yes, yes, yes. So, that's it. Okay. No, because 
I, I'm, I'm curious, Cormier, if your game was translated into uh, Castilian Spanish or Latin American Mexican Spanish, because uh, do you happen to know? Uh, I don't know, but I, I know that the publisher is based in Spain. So, oh, so I, probably I would, Castilian yeah, Spanish. probably Castilian, yes. Yeah. Because uh, personally, as I get my feet wet, uh, finding the TTPRGers, finding the Dragoners online, but finding those that look like me and have my shared cultural background, I can really appreciate, um, oh, there's content created in, so to say, in my language, in Spanish. There is content that is created uh, not just for the best selling, but I can appreciate the challenges it takes to create content that is more focused on experiences that as a player and the creator share. Because Amelia said one of the best things about TTRPGs, especially indie ones, is the insertion of the self. The individual with that diverse, unique experience is way more interested, interesting than whatever algorithm Marvel uh, has put together to make the next movie. <laughs> Let's see. Um, taking talk on the time, let's go for one big question, and then at the end we're going to uh, let's see what's going to happen. This kind of uh, floats into what was previously brought up about funding. Yeah, I'm sorry. We live in the C, C word world where we kind of have to eat, and uh, doesn't like you can't grow avocados in some countries because of legislation, so you have to grow your own food. <laughs> so the topic or question uh, overall is about. Um, TTRPGs primarily in that community uh, driven space, especially with a uh, crowdfunding. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Comet is the only one who ended up being published by a third party uh, company, is that correct? This way, right? I'm Amelia and Mansfeld, you are completely I, I independent. I published through Nitro. So far. Uh, yes, I'm too. just just right. So, um, Let's start with uh, Mansfield and Amelia. Have any of you considered reaching out for um, C-word capitalist traditional funding mechanisms or going to studios and pitching for them? What are the pros and cons of so far having done so or not doing so? I looked it up. Like I looked up going to like uh, publishers. The problem is that like I looked up Coliseum, but they only want you to make their own games. Mm. Obviously, uh, on Onyx Path, I just don't wanna. And, uh, you know, that's the point. There aren't many, and those that there are tend to be very specific about what they want. Like, it's really hard to pitch to, pitch to Evil Ath something that is not 2d6. Because their audience is the PBTA audience. Obviously, they want more PBTA games. That's just how it's gonna, that's just how it's gonna be. To the industry it's, trends, right? The, the more, the problem is, like, the more your game is out there, the art there it is to um it is to get it published like the stroke of the stroke of luck is not exactly something you can uh, rely on unluckily the fact is that the big publishers tend to tend to only care about what what makes them money and like by by your own definitions in the games don't always do that exactly i mean that, that's um, part of the crux it's it's hard. You kind of need to make a name for yourself, like that. Uh, that helps. And then usually, what you do is you end up just working on a publication on, 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 of another game as a game developer. Mm -hmm. If you want to make your own game and you and you want it to be like an original thing, that's the that is like extremely happy. That's not to say that like you can't make a decent a decent backing on Kickstarter like independently. It takes up an absurd amount of work, of networking, getting to know people. It's I can't stress how hard that is. I I can't stress enough how difficult that is, though. Like, and especially with like again companies using Kickstarter to like yeah. show off their stuff instead of letting it be what it's supposed to be as that is you know independent platform. Thank you. Uh, Look, if we make, thoughts. sorry, oh, go ahead. finish your like, thoughts. If we, if we keep making stuff like indie game conventions, but then we give, we, then during it we give prizes to like extremely large games that everyone knows and that are published by a big house, then we're kind of defeating the point of indie games. Okay, so 
truth to I yourself. I could say that not talking about here. anyone. I could That's say that Amelia right. actually pointed out all the reasons why I did. I don't want to actually make a, a Kickstarter because it's anxious uh, at, at the shortest. Actually, it's anxious, mm -hmm. and I'm already. Uh, I could say that I'm already uh, autistic person, so I already have a kind of short circles of the contact. So. It already did hampers me with with actually making any kind of the making something making something that relies on many people actually in the first place, and second of all, I would like to have a have a publisher who talk who 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 actually points at me saying, "Hey, I want to physically release your game or like that, publish your game physically." But you know that was a, actually be a miracle, and I don't believe in miracles. So, I what I wanted to do instead. So to make to continue actually the trend of what I can by myself, or at least I can handle by releasing P P P PDFs and PDFs and those in those medias that I, I can actually make either on my own or at least I can organize on my own. I tend to actually I just don't have a particular interest of making the physical games because I want I know that I, it will fail. In either either by by the process of actually organizing things or maybe would fail because well, I already heard many stories from Poland about the printers how they supposedly five times in a row they print a book badly or other <laughs> funny but actually not funny stories about it. For 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 the record, at the beginning of the stream we played a game you made. I had fun. I don't know by what measure you consider yourself a failure success, but I'm going to just arbitrarily overrule whatever you have to say in your head and tell you that's a success. So, success is not mine. I mean, I, I assume that this was seal of approval, right? It made it made me yeah. happy. I think it made the rest of us happy. Yeah. Yeah. Seals of approval. Uh, yeah. Su Come success on. is no money, and that's that's where it is. That's where the, the, the point is, I guess. About funding, indie, get it, get it, keeping that indie vibe or going to where there are greener Success pastures. Is people play your game and it's and it actually touches them inside. Mm. That is success. Everything yes. else is just money. Yes. yes. Like, big, big I don't know. I like I like living, but I'm not that attached <laughs> to it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Big big seal of approval on that. I, I actually I before I started uh, writing RPGs, I I wrote some some novels, and um, and you know they were not very successful uh, uh, financially wise, but also I never received any comment or reaction on them, and which was kind of depressing. And with RPGs, what I think is so great is that uh, as you said, uh, uh, money is great, act, uh, obviously, because we, we live in a money-based society. But the feeling you get when someone uh, leaves a positive comment on your game or just uh, uh, mentions you on, on Twitter or whatever saying, hey, I, I liked your game, that, that's just so, that, that's priceless. Uh, that being said, um, to, to come back on, on the subject of money, uh, yeah, for my games, for, for most games I make now, I go through uh, systems of funding. I've done two Kickstarters and I've done one uh, each funding as well. Um, and that's just because, uh, I mean, no, no publisher, uh, uh, no big publisher would be interested in, in one of my games. I, I doubt that the Spanish publisher we mentioned before would have been interested in my game if it hadn't already been uh, successful in its funding. Um, and so to, to do what I want to do with the games, which is uh, to, I think my primary goal when I Fund, when I try to finance a game is to bring it into print form and also of course to pay people to make the game look uh, much better than I could do by myself so to pay a layout artist to pay some illustrators and so on uh, I need the money that I don't have and and actually so so that's why I, I do Kickstarter and, and so on and actually my first Kickstarter uh, for uh, uh, my, my first game two years ago my first big game two years ago uh, it ended in and it ended costing me three euros uh, uh, after the, the financing was finished, after uh -huh. I paid everyone, I gave bonuses to everyone, etc. And I, I actually lost, well, I, 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 I gained back the money since, you know, but um, that's, that's, I just bring up this, this example to say that, uh, again, since I'm not 
since my primary goal is not to make money with these games, I can also afford the risk of making a Kickstarter and, and not uh, making money myself. Uh, as long as the finished product is, looks good, I'm, I'm happy with that. But that's because I, I don't make a living of it. Seal of approval. Seal of approval for everyone. I think uh, yes. there is so much we can continue talking on. And um, unfortunately, I think uh, our time for today is up here. But I want to, again, thank everyone so, so much, our, our esteemed panelists. Uh, you all did an amazing job. I think I got to know each of you a bit better. I can really much appreciate, as the outsider looking in, uh, the struggles and the passions you put behind your game. And um, whether the bar is high or low, um, I hope that your community members have the time and the means and reminder to everyone in the community reach out to your creators tell them you're having fun tell them if you're not having fun be constructive and give a suggestion uh support where you're able to and play the game don't just have it uh, uh sitting somewhere or rust amelia will make you into a frog i'm um, an actual witch i can't <laughs> that's what i'm saying that's nothing to laugh so um before we sign off, let's do uh, one last round of remind the good people who you are, where they can find you, and what they should be excited about. You tell them. So, uh, Kome, kick us off. So, uh, people can find me on, on Twitter and on uh, the I've got an Ichio uh, page as well, which is just, just my name with ich.io uh, on it. And also, the links are in the chat. I also have a, a Discord server, which is mostly in French, but but can come by uh, I, I speak English so I will welcome you very gladly uh, what you should be excited about I'm doing uh, my next project that I hopefully will bring to Zinquest if they ever uh, you know decide to announce it at some point already um, that Zinquest is taking place um, but I so my, my next uh, project with, is uh, tentatively called uh, Feathered Adventures and it's basically uh, DuckTales uh, uh, tribute, uh, uh, GMLS rules light RPG. Um, so that's going to be fun. I'm excited. Thank you very much. And we hope to see more of you in panels like this. Uh, definitely going to For be following sure. your Twitter. I'm going to have auto translate on. <laughs> Amelia. <laughs> Hello, I'm Amelia. I am the lead designer and artist of Legion Craft Games. And we make indie games of all shapes and forms as a as a job for as a as, as our main job because we are absolutely we are absolutely financially responsible uh we are the uh, authors of 12 inner demons and now 12 occultai is being played on this channel every saturday and that game is going to be out very soon with our kickstarter going very soon it's a an extremely good game about your own traumas coming out as demons to help you Nice. What you, sorry, what did you say? What did you say? Say small, uh, s s small action figure of the Osafune. Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> Consume indie games. Talk about. Talk to your friends about indie games. Do it. Okay, okay. Uh, Manfeld, you're my friend now. Tell us. Remind uh, the good people so, who you are. Okay, and I am Manfeld. My legal name is Michał Przygotski, and that is on the title of my games. And I am. And you can find me on the Ichio by name Common Fortress Ichio Ichio. Also, you can find me on the Twitter under the nickname Mansfeld underscore is underscore as a symbol is. And find me. And also, if you are really there or you are, you are really, uh, I could say it's about. Uh... Okay, I don't. I forgot what is that adjective. But if you really want to wait a long time, you can also find find me at my. Polish, but sometimes in English to a blog called Tierza Powszechna, and the address is commonfortress.com. Okay, type those things in the chat, and I'm sure yes. our facilitators will uh, make that available for you. Oh, okay, so I need to launch it actually. Perfect. Um, my name is Aida. I am a lay person, but I am someone who feels incredibly welcomed and empowered uh, in this wonderful community. If I could get here, all of you can be in this happy place with these amazing and welcoming people. Speaking of amazing and welcoming people, we have to thanks once again thank the ladies of D&D &D community 
for hosting yes. us, for giving us space on their wonderful, large, moderated, curated uh, community, and especially for setting up in December, which will be full of more panels and featuring one shots in many uh, campaigns, featuring some people who may be on this panel and some people who, as uh, players and uh, GMs. So the entire schedule can be found announcements thereof on ladies of PD <coughs> Twitter. Check the links for their Discord where things are also posted. And thank you also to the amazing uh, audience. Thank you to our tech mistress, uh, Jenna, behind the scenes. And uh, thank you again, everyone. It's been a pleasure getting to know you all. I wish you all nothing but success in your current projects, in your future projects. And may you feel all the love and receive this seal of approval as we sign out. Thanks, Aida. Thanks. See you. Seal of approval. Bye, everyone.